Good to see you guys this morning. You guys still praying for rain? July and August is coming. Well, it's good to see y'all. And it, you know, is there something wrong with this section? Is this reserved? You know, it's kind of fascinating. You know, that's a study in itself, the human dynamic of crowd dynamics and all of that. And, uh, you know, but that's not my area of expertise. We're not going to get into all that. But it is fascinating sometimes. And uh, you know what? We have been studying the book of Revelation. And last week, we looked into uh, the, the idea of the great eagle. And I told you it's kind of a mystery. And I believe the great eagle is um, it's an airlift of believers out of Jerusalem, probably to the area of Edom, probably to Petra. And I am, try, I am praying, and I've prayed all week, about that the United States is that great eagle. Because, you know, our national sim- symbol is the eagle. And it doesn't say that we are. It doesn't say that we aren't. But you know what? The Bible and God gives us lots of latitude. He doesn't provide us with a lot of details. And so he gives us latitude to pray things into being, pray things to be a certain way. Remember in Matthew 24, he said, pray that the flight, pray that the escape from Egypt, pray that that will not happen on a Sabbath or in the winter. So he said, basically he's allowing believers to pray and to change the timing of the flight, which is the middle of the 70th week. Well, if you change the timing of the 70th week, you also change the timing of the second coming of Jesus Christ, don't you? Yes, because the 70th week is a specific period of time. You also change the timing of the rapture. And so that's an incredible amount of power and latitude God gives us to pray into being. And so I took that and said, hey, if that's the case, we don't know if we're the great eagle or not. We don't know that. It doesn't say we're not. It doesn't say we are. Why can't we pray it that our country, in the end, takes a last stand against the most diabolical, evil dictator that's ever been on the face of the earth, takes a last stand and helps believing Jews with an airlift to get out of Jerusalem? I'm praying that, and I'm going to do my best to pray that into existence, that our country takes a last stand against the Antichrist and his kingdom. So also, have you been praying for Israel? Yep, I have been praying for Israel also, and I've been praying the 83rd Psalm, which we're not going to go there for time, but praying the 83rd Psalm for Israel and the great eagle, which I believe is us. So now we're in Revelation chapter 13. Now these are, you know, I've been through some of the favorite, my favorite chapters in Revelation. This is not one of my favorite chapters. I just don't, I don't like the subject. I don't like the Antichrist. I don't like his kingdom. I don't like those things. Now, it is very interesting, and it is even so, it is important to us, even though we're not going to be living through this time, it is still important because this chapter, along with some chapters in Daniel, can help kind of give us a picture of the Antichrist and his kingdom, can help us understand what it looks like, and why is that important? to us if we're going to be raptured out anyway well remember second thessalonians chapter 2 says two things have to happen before the rapture and those two things are the apostasy which i believe we're living in the beginnings or maybe the end of the apostasy now which is a falling away of the faith correct the other thing is the appearance of the man of lawlessness the appearance of the antichrist well that being the case then that's what we are to be looking for to be watching for to identify him and his coming kingdom, even though we're not going to be living at a time when he has total control like he is during the first three and a half, and even to some degree as God takes away his control in the last three and a half of the 70th week. And so beginning in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 13, this is the 35th message out of Revelation. And I told you I was going to try to finish Revelation by Christmas, and I went through and just started guessing at how many I'm not I don't know if we're gonna make it'd be a miracle (laughs) there's just there's so much especially as we get to the end there is so many things and you, you just hate to skip over it so you know if you've set your hopes on that I'm sorry to disappoint you I don't think we're gonna make it but we're gonna keep preaching the word here and uh keep working our way through the book of Revelation and maybe you know that'd be a present for 2020 All right, verse 1 and 2, and the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Now, last week I had you, if I said the dragon or whatever, I had you all do what? 
Boom, boom, boom. Right, right. He is this dragon. This is Satan, right? And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. Now, continuing in verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Now, do those beasts, that is a, a strange-looking beast, isn't it? Remember, a lot of things in the book of Revelation are symbolic. This isn't literally a beast that's like a leopard, and his feet are like a bear, and his mouth is that of a lion. It's not literally that. Those things are symbolic. If you go back to Daniel, which we will in a minute, you go back to Daniel, those things are given as symbolism of empires. And in Daniel, when Daniel receives the vision, Daniel usually goes and asks, what is going on? I don't know what this means. And the angel or whoever is given the vision tells him what they mean. And so that's how we know. We don't have to guess at the meaning of those things because in Daniel it tells us specifically in this imagery, these symbols are used in the book of Daniel. And so that makes the interpretation easy on those things. Now, what are we talking about here, this beast from the sea? You see, in Daniel, we'll look at there's a, a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Those things, those are empires. Bless you. That was a good sneeze. <clears throat> that was my daughter, by the way. She gets that from her mother. So, Now, where, where was I? <laughs> I started thinking about my wife's sneeze because she can sneeze. If she ever sneezes, all of you are going to know it's her sneeze. One, in fact, in Academy the other day, I was waiting up for her up at the front, and she was way in the back, and she sneezed, and I thought, there she is. I know exactly where she is. It's like a, a beacon locator. I can find her. The beast, yes, thank you. Oh, yes, and so this, these beasts, thank you. Somebody's going to, you guys are, keep me on track, okay? Okay, now, these beasts are like, uh, they're empires, okay? But at the same time, I want you to look at the scriptures as we're studying them, and I'll try to point it out a little bit. It talks about these beasts as though they're an empire, and then, but yet it talks about the beast as though it's a person too. And so there's been a lot of debate over the centuries of whether the beast is an actual person or whether it's an empire. And I tell you what, I think it's both. I think it's both. The reason I think so is because God always closely associates the king and his kingdom in, in these scriptures. And if you look at it, Satan himself is trying to copy what God does. And right now, we're living, remember, in the kingdom of heaven, the spiritual kingdom where God is ruling spiritually but not physically yet because of the prince of the power of the air, right, the dragon. And so, but right now, you, can you separate the kingdom of heaven, the spiritual kingdom in which we live, can you separate that from the king who is Christ? They're inseparable. If you talk about the kingdom of heaven, you're talking about Christ, correct? If you're talking about Christ, you're talking about his kingdom that, and so Satan is copying those things, and he's a, he is a great counterfeiter. And so the king and the kingdom, when it's talking about these beasts, it's talking about the beast as a kingdom and also the dictator or the leader of that kingdom. Now turning back to Daniel chapter 7, we'll be in Daniel 7 and then Daniel 11, and I'm going to take one verse where we in chapter 7, I'll take one verse, verse 8, and then we're going to skip ahead. These verses are about the Antichrist. Now remember the horns and the diadems and all of that? These are kings that kind of rise out of the kingdom, and then, but there's one horn that's going to rise above all the others, and that horn is the Antichrist. Now look at verse 8. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. That's about the Antichrist. Now look, for us, what does this exactly look like as three horns are plucked out? So in other words, he takes over three kingdoms or, or gets rid of three leaders 
of the revived Roman Empire. We don't know exactly what that looks like, but I'm telling you, the people who are living in the 70th week, they're going to see that. They're going to understand that's the three horns that were plucked out by the one little horn. They're going to see it. You know, and that's amazing to me when you get to see prophecy being fulfilled. Isn't that amazing to you? What about the restoration of Israel as a nation? That's prophecy being fulfilled in preparation for the end times. It's amazing when you get to see prophecy fulfilled. And the people who are living during the 70th week are going to get to see these things. Now, we might also, because this could be, remember, the appearance of the Antichrist happens. I believe that's the first seal, the, the appearance of the Antichrist. I believe the rapture is the sixth seal, as I've talked to you about. And then, so that means that we may see the rise of the Antichrist. We may actually get to see the three horns plucked out by the one little horn. We may get to see that. So pay attention to that. You know, watch for things. Are you looking for the Antichrist? Are you looking among world leaders as they rise? I told you once before about um, a man, the Austrian, is he prime minister, chancellor? I, I forget the terms, but he's Sebastian Kurtz. There's something about that guy I just don't like. He's, very, he's young for a world leader, rose up quickly, very charismatic. Maybe, I don't know. We're supposed to be watching. Let's keep watching and looking for the appearance of the Antichrist. Okay, now skipping over to verse 17, continuing about uh, the beasts. Now, these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. So now it's talking about them as individuals, correct? Now, but the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. I don't want to skip over that verse. You know, as we're in these chapters, sometimes it's easy to get overwhelmed by the evil and the negative and all of that that's going on. But look at what God does. Always in the middle, he provides like a nugget for us. He provides something. Look at this. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Now, that's an amen right there. No matter what, no matter what these beasts look like, no matter what the Antichrist, what he does, this is what's going to happen. That's our destiny. That's our destiny. That's what's going to happen. You're, the chaos and all kinds of stuff in between, but that's our destiny, and that's where we're going to end up. Praise the Lord for that. You know, in the same way with our own lives, have you ever heard it said, God never promised us a smooth flight. He just promised us a safe landing. Have you heard that before? You know, if you're looking for a smooth flight and you always associate, you know what, I'm doing something wrong because my flight's not smooth. You know, this world is full of troubles and difficulties, amen? But here's the, here's the smooth landing right here in the middle of it. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. And that is true because, remember, because of the work of Jesus Christ and because of the blood of Jesus, we're grafted in. But not only are we grafted into the family, it says we are co-inheritors with Christ. Now think of that. Remember, he saved us from becoming entirely evil. And not only that, he made us co-inheritors with him. That's almost crazy, isn't it? You know, I've, I've joked about it before. If you, if you were to come up with a plan, and sometimes we tried to come up with better salvation plans than God, have we not? Or God, why did you do it this way? Or God, why are you doing it this way? You know, we, we all do that. But could you have ever conceived a plan that was as far out there and as crazy as what God did? No, one, no man could have ever thought of this. It's just too much. God, here's what I expect of you. I expect you to come as a person. Then I expect you to let us kill you, and that death serve as a sacrifice for us. And then on top of that, you make us co-inheritors with your son. That's the plan I want. Yeah, who would have ever thought of that? God. God's grace is amazing. Okay, in verse 19 here. Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others. Now, remember the beast that talks about the Roman Empire, correct? Exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron, its claws of brawn, and which devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up and before which three of them fell, namely that horn, which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, which were larger in appearance than its associates. You didn't think I could do that with one breath, did you? I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. 
Remember the fifth seal, right? Martyrdom. And remember, even into the 70th week, all of the martyrdom that takes place. In verse 22, until the ancient of days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one, and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ, correct? Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise. You ever heard, remember all the speculation to talk about when the European Union formed a ten-nation confederacy? D- you, you didn't? Okay, well, the reason some people were excited about that is because the, the ten kings. And you see, the European Union is like a revived Roman Empire. And so I do think, I don't know that the European Union is the revived Roman Empire yet. I don't think so because the Antichrist hasn't appeared. But I think that that is preparing the way. I think we can see that the way is being prepared for the Antichrist to come by a new world order, by the revival of the Roman Empire, not individual nations, all of them coming together as one, and many other things. We'll get into a few of them. Okay, uh, verse 25, then we'll go to chapter 11 in Daniel, which is where I really want to be. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. Do you see what that, what, you know, times and things that have already happened, they either happened and they didn't. How many Holocaust deniers are there now? They deny that the Holocaust even existed. This is going to continue, and it's another sign that we are getting close, close, close to the time when the Antichrist makes his appearance. He's going to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time's times, and half a time, right? Now, that time, times, and half a time is basically, we interpret that to be a a three-and-a-half-year period. Now, I think, it's my opinion, some people teach that the Antichrist is in his ultimate control in the last three-and-a-half years of the 70th week. I think this is a reference to the first three-and-a-half. The reason is because last chapter, remember in last chapter, when Jesus It said, basically, the elders fell down his feet and said, you have taken your great power and begun to reign. In the last three and a half, Jesus begins to dismantle the Antichrist kingdom. He begins to dismantle Babylon. He begins to dismantle the one world government. He begins to dismantle one world finance. He begins to dismantle all of these things, the one world religion. All of these things are being dismantled and power is taken away from him And his kingdom is brought down until the very end when Jesus comes back at the end of the 70th week. So now, skipping over to 11. Daniel chapter 11, starting in verse 36. Speaking again of the Antichrist and his kingdom. Then the king will do as he pleases. And he will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will speak monstrous monstrous things against the god of gods. And he will prosper until the indignation is finished. So he's going to be very, very successful on what he's doing until it's finished. Beginning the decline in the middle of the 70th week all the way until it's finished with the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's going to be very, very successful. He will prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. Now, verse 37, he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women. Do you know what said that in there about the Antichrist? Now, what does that mean? You know, he may be such an egomaniac that he doesn't have any interest in women at all. All he's interested in is himself. Or then again, he very well may be a homosexual. He very well may be. And I tend to believe that way because if we look at the the direction that our culture is going, can't you see that that is also the way is being prepared for him in that way too? Absolutely. Now, just a little bit, 
homosexuality is a sin. You know, the Bible says that. That's not me. I'm not spewing hate speech. I'm telling you what Jesus said. Jesus said homosexuality is a sin. But Jesus said lots of things were sins too. You know, and it is not in our place to be in judgment. Our place is to tell the truth. In our place, we judge upon ourselves, and the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. Now, what about this this gay and lesbian movement? What about it? Well, you know what? Here's my philosophy on that. You know, we tell people the truth. But at the same time, if they do not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and they want to live that lifestyle, then it's not our job to stop them. That's not our job. In fact, doesn't God allow them to have free will? Is it our job to restrict their free will? No, it's not. And so at the same time, the way I see it, if somebody chooses that instead of Jesus, then that's all they're going to have. If that's their desire of their heart and the pleasure that they have, that's the only good thing they're going to get out of this life. It really is. And it's not our job to try to stop them. It's our job to be a light in a dark world. It's our job to tell people the truth. That's our job. Not legislate morality or try to, man, it would be so easy, I think, to spread the gospel if we could spread it by force and by law. Uh, Does anybody in here, I bet every one of us has a family member you'd like to put in a headlock and you won't let them out until they accept Jesus. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Doesn't work that way, does it? God gives everybody free will. He is a respecter of your free will, and he's a respecter of the person's free will who does not believe. So we are too. All right, Daniel chapter 11, 36 to 45. But again, I'll tell you, it's a sin, all right? He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other god. Now, wait a minute. What about the one world religion, right? He's going to be, there's going to be one world religion. There's going to be one world government, and there's going to be a one world economy under him, all united under him. But what about this religion? It says right here he has no regard for religion. He's using the religion to get what he wants. He has no interest in it in itself. To him, he is the religion. To him, he is God. His desire ultimately is to be worshipped. He's not a religious person at all. He's using it for his benefit, okay, to achieve total world domination, total world control, and ultimately worship and glory. So it kind of gives us a profile of what he's going to look like, what he's going to be involved in. So now, if you, if you find somebody on the world stage, you think, could this be the Antichrist? Okay, and he's been married for a long time. It's probably not him, right? Okay. You see? You don't. Nor will he... Nor will he show regard for any other God, for he will magnify himself above them all. But instead, he will honor a God of fortresses, a God whom his father did not know. He will honor him with gold, silver, costly stones, and treasure. Now, what is his God? His God is money. And his God, I believe, the God of fortresses is, a, is the God of military might. See, all the kingdoms that's gone on before us, the, uh, not before us, but all the kingdoms and the beasts that it talks about, they were military and mighty They were mighty because of their military, and I think the Antichrist is going to be the same way. As he rises, I believe the sixth seal, when that happens, that's a devastating event that takes place. I believe the rapture occurs at that point. But what it says in the sixth seal, it says that every mountain is moved and every island is moved. Now, you think about that, how devastating of an act of earthquake and things that happen on the earth during the sixth seal. I mean, it is going to be complete chaos and destruction. So much so that people may not even realize for a long time that there's a significant number of people missing, right? There'll be lots of people missing. They're going to be looking for people in the rubble. They're going to be, uh, there's going to be a, a mystery. And where did all these people go? They won't know it at first, my opinion. Okay, now, out of that rubble and destruction, the Antichrist, I believe that will solidify his power, solidify him to come 
and take control on the world stage. So he's going to rise basically from the rubble and offer solutions. You know, at the same time, isn't he the very embodiment of Satan? Yes, he is. The Bible says that he is the embodiment of Satan. Do you see how that is a copy of what God has done? You have God the Father, the God-man who is the embodiment of God and man form, correct? God the Son, and then you have the Holy Spirit. Well, guess what? We'll look next week. There's a satanic trinity. You have Satan. You have the Satan man, which is the Antichrist. And then you have the false prophet, which is like the Holy Spirit. It's a counterfeit. It's a copy. Okay, so instead he will honor a God of fortresses, a God whom his fathers did not know. He will honor him with gold, silver, costly stones, and treasures. Now look, he will take action against the strongest of fortresses with help of a foreign God. So he's going to take action against other strong fortresses or military might, correct, with the help of a foreign God. Do you know who that God is? Satan. Now remember, he is the embodiment of Satan, okay? And Satan is... He was a wonderful part of the creation before he fell, correct? He was smart. He was powerful. He was beautiful in appearance. And he fell. Now, he has been working this for centuries, correct? He has been involved in the nations. He's been involved in these other beasts. He's been involved in kingdoms in our time. And so he knows a lot about world power and world kingdoms. Satan does. He knows a lot about economy and finance. Would you say that's true? He knows a lot about human nature. He knows a lot. He has centuries. He has millennia of experience studying mankind, studying kingdoms, studying finance, and the Antichrist is going to be smarter in all these things than anybody we've ever seen besides Jesus Christ. He's going to be smarter in all these things. He's going to know. He already knows what will work and what won't work. Most kingdoms and these beasts, they failed for one weakness or another. Not this one. They already know what works and what doesn't work. They already know how to bring about success because of the experience and the intellect of Satan, and that will be in the Antichrist. He will have solutions for things that we never thought possible. But even that, his kingdom and that experience and that wisdom, his kingdom is still only a poor copy of the real deal. You understand when Jesus comes back, he's setting up an earthly kingdom, not just a spiritual kingdom, an earthly kingdom, and he will rule physically on the earth, combining the spiritual kingdom and the physical kingdom. That's when you're going to see real wisdom. That's when you're going to see real intellect, no longer a counterfeit kingdom, a real kingdom, how things are supposed to be done. So it's going to look like he will be the most diabolic powerful leader the world has ever seen over all the other beasts but it will only be a poor copy of the true kingdom of god so he will take action against the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god he will give great honor to those who acknowledge him and will cause them to rule over the many and will parcel out land for a price okay let me see Because we're still in the first two verses. Oh, I showed you verse 41 last week of how he will not gain complete control over just a few places on earth, correct? But everybody else, basically all the other places of the world, he will achieve domination over. Now go back to Revelation. See, I told you there is no way to finish this by Christmas. I'm doing good to finish this one today. You know, it's, it's wet and rainy. What else are you going to do, right? Preach it. We got till lunch, correct? Okay, let's go to verse 3 and 4. Okay, so now I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed. Okay, so one of the heads, there was a fatal wound. Now, remember, I told you about counterfeit copies, correct? Well, guess what? You know what Jesus did? He didn't just die on the cross and be laid in the tomb. The tomb's empty. 
He was raised from the dead. And we walk in the power of that resurrection today. And you also have a like resurrection coming in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen for that. Don't you think Satan wants a copy of that? Think about it. A fake resurrection. Now, Satan's going to be given power to do, through the Antichrist and the false prophet, to do some pretty miraculous things. I do not believe this is a resurrection from the dead. It's a healing from a fatal wound. You see, that's not a true resurrection from the dead, correct? Now, so is it talking about a person here? You know, the people that say, no, the beast is only an empire. They say the beast is an empire, it's not a person. They say that, okay, the way they interpret this verse is, well, that's the beast then is the Roman empire, and it looks like it's dead, but it's going to be revived. Do you see that? Right? Yeah. You got it. The Roman Empire was a long time ago in Jesus' first coming, correct? And it wasn't a world power, and it's still not a world power, but it will be again. So there's reviving from looks like a fatal wound. So that's the people that say it's not a man. Now, for the people who say it's a man, they say, well, that's the counterfeit resurrection. That's a person. He received a fatal wound, and he was healed by it, and everybody's going to be amazed by it. Okay? That's why I say It's really both. You can't separate a dictator from his empire. It's both. So I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They don't, the majority of the people here, they don't accept the true resurrection. They don't accept the true resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, but they're going to take the false one. Man, I tell you, how, the, how so is that true? People don't accept true joy today. They want pleasure and comfort. You see what I'm saying? Even in our own lives, we're tempted on a daily basis to take the counterfeit and not the real thing, to live out the life, to pick up our cross and follow him. So he receives this fatal wound and he's healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him? Somehow through all of this, he achieves military power over all others. And no one is going to be able to stand against him until Jesus Christ does at the second coming. Now, in verse 5 and 6, there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Again, many people interpret this 42 months is three and a half years. Many people interpret this in different ways. Is this the second half or the first half? I interpret that 42 months to be the first half. He's given authority to act. He signed the peace treaty with Israel, has world dominance during the during the 70th week. But remember, in the middle of the 70th week, Jesus Christ begins to tear his kingdoms down. He begins to tear them down. So his total control happens, I think, in the first three and a half years. And he opened his mouth and blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, and those who dwell in heaven. Do you understand? He's talking about, about us too. Isn't he? By this time, we're in heaven. He's talking bad about those that are raptured. You know, my opinion, not in the Bible, but one of the things I think is going to be said, and and this may be a reference to it, is they're going to realize after the sixth seal that there's a bunch of people missing. They're going to realize that they are Christians. And see, Christians are going to become more and more persecuted because we're intolerant. Because we believe what the Bible says. We believe that Jesus is the only way to God, and that's intolerant, right? And so we're going to be, the one world religion will come about because there's multiple pathways to God. You know, I was talking to a guy at the Lexus dealer the other day because both the keys on Milo's car broke. Made out of plastic. So anyway, I'm not going to get on a soapbox about all that. So I had to drive, and you can't just go get a key made anymore. They have computer chips in them, right? And so I had to go all the way to the Lexus dealer in Fort Worth. Well, when I got there, 
there's this young man, and I start talking to him about God. And he believes that worldview that, you know what, they all go to the same place. And I said, well, what I told him was, you know, I used to think that way. I said, but Jesus made a truth claim. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he said, to make it even clearer, no one comes to the Father but by me. Very clear. And I said, either Jesus was the I am, or he was a lunatic. There's no room in between. I accepted Jesus as God. Therefore, his truth claim is that he is the only way. He said, well, yeah. Can't put him in a headlock. <laughs> Wanted to. But then I realized on the way home, I realized, you know what? Those stupid keys probably broke so I could go up there and throw some seeds out, right? And I had a bad attitude about it. I usually do. So, yeah, I throw them seeds out there. You never know, right? All right. See, and now I lost track of where I was again. What is going on? I think I'm about half a cup of coffee short. That's what it is today. What's that? First, oh, of Revelation, yeah. <laughs> All right, so he's speaking, oh, yeah, he speaks out. Thank you so much, Olene. He speaks out against those who are believers. Blast oh, yeah, that's where I was going with this. Okay, one of the explanations I think he's going to give for the rapture, this is where I wanted to go, is I think that he is going to say something like this, because people are going to start to realize there are bunches of people just plain missing. They're not under rubble, right? And they're, starting to, they're going to find all the dead from the sixth seal and, or most of the dead from the sixth seal, but there are just an enormous number of people that are just plain missing. I think the Antichrist is going to offer this explanation. They were intolerant, and God took them in wrath. He removed them. It was an act of the wrath of God, and this shows that we're on the right path. Opposite, see? I think the world will accept it. The world will believe that we are taken in judgment, not taken the glory. It is, a, it is those Christians, right? Wasn't it Nero that said that it's the Christian's fault that Rome burnt down? Isn't it the Antichrist? It's... It's the Christian's fault that all these earthquakes and all this calamity has been brought on us, and God took them in judgment. So finally, finally, we can do what we need to do, and we can be successful, and, and we can do things the right way. See, we're on the right path. He will, be, he will have charisma. He will be exceptionally brilliant. Yeah, look like verse 6, and he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, that is, and those who dwell in heaven. Okay, then verse 7, it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority of every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. World domination. That, you know, you go back to the other beasts, they never achieved total world domination. There were parts of the world that were left out. The Antichrist, he will have world domination. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. So now, do you ever worry about perhaps worry that, you know what, I don't want to accidentally take the number of the beast. Next week we'll be talking about the number of the beast. Have you ever worried about that? No, I was the only one. You guys are already asleep today. You know what? A lot of people over the years thought, you know what? The Social Security number that were issued, that's the number of the beast. There's been all of this speculation about the number of the beast. And I don't want to accidentally take the number of beasts and, and be damned, right? Well, that's not going to happen. Do you see this verse? Besides for that, the rapture occurs before the time when the number of the beast is issued. But at the same time, look. 
All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Every na- everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. So what that means is the Christians who are living during this time, not us, they will not be fooled. They see it. They know it. They're not going to be fooled. Verse 9, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Now, verse 10, I tell you, until about Friday, I was still uncertain of the interpretation, and I think I've got a handle on the interpretation of this verse. It says, if anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. What is that talking about? Remember, in the first three and a half years, the saints, those that believe, are protected. They're sealed, correct? The 144,000 are sealed. Other believers are sealed. The two prophets are protected. They can't be killed the first three and a half years. But remember, at the midpoint, the Antichrist goes up and kills them. Now, one of the reasons I think that the whole world's not going to be deceived, I mean, the whole world, all of Christians aren't going to be deceived. What do you think these two prophets are preaching? Remember when Jesus came to the river to be baptized and John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's not in the Bible, but I'll bet you when the Antichrist comes up to them, it's on TV, the whole world's watching. I'll bet you, I'll bet you a nickel, and you have to pay me in heaven. I'll bet you a nickel, these two prophets say, here he is, the beast, the antichrist, the very embodiment of Satan himself. And they testify to the whole world right there who he is before they die. What you do, do it quickly, they say. I think you're going to owe me a nickel. So if anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. So the last three and a half years, the believers are not protected. The two prophets aren't protected. The 144,000 have been martyred. Okay, This verse 10 is talking about believers in the last three and a half years, and here's why I think so. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. Christians are going to be imprisoned, millions of them during this time. And if anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. What does that mean? If they resist the Antichrist and fight him, they will die. He will win. Okay, but that's part of being a Christian. No matter what, even the ones that fight him with the sword, if they die, that's a good thing, correct? You believe that with me, don't you? Our death is the best thing that will ever happen to us. Even though, you know, I don't want to die today, maybe later, but at the same time, that's the best thing that will happen to us, correct? Yes. And so we can't lose, and the Christians during this time also can't lose. But now those that don't, that live through, probably in captivity when Jesus comes back, there will still be Christians alive in prison. Those Christians who lived all the way through, they will be the ones that repopulate the earth with mortals during the millennial kingdom. Not all of them are going to be killed by the Antichrist. Some of them are probably going to be in prison and survive until Jesus comes back, sets them free. They're the Adam and Eves during the millennial kingdom. They're the Noah's family during the millennial kingdom that repopulate the earth at a time when Jesus Christ rules, merges the spiritual and physical kingdom. He merges the two kingdoms, and mortals will be living with immortals. We will be there and we'll be helping Christ rule during this time. And the people who survive to the end, they will repopulate the earth under the leadership and kingship and lordship of Jesus Christ. So if anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. And then here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. You know, one thing that's been on my heart this week, and I'm going to add to my prayer emphasis, is martyrs. Because martyrdom is going to continue to increase all the way until the second coming of Jesus Christ. You know, we live in a blessed nation. 
where we can come here without fear of being arrested? Did you, did you know that 200 million Christians live in countries where it's illegal to be a Christian? It's an estimate. That's amazing, isn't it? Every year there are thousands of martyrs, many of them missionaries, going to these places where it's illegal. Many of them. Over 800 churches last year were attacked. Those things are going to continue. But guys, just like it said, just like Jesus said, John 16, 16, 1 through 3, you said to keep going. These things, amen, these things I have spoken to you so that you may not, so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcast from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think he is offering service to God. That continues to this day. That's a prophecy about the Jews killing the Christians, but it's also a prophecy about today that they're going to think there's going to come a time when people will think killing us will serve God. Now, what did the 9-11 guys yell as they flew into the, flew the airplanes into the building? I don't remember, but it's something about Allah, correct? And they thought they were doing a service for God. Right? That's exactly what that scripture says. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Now, skipping the 1633. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. So, you know, as we look at these scriptures, never forget that. And no matter what tribulation or storms you're going through, you can have peace because of the peace of Jesus Christ. Peace I give you. Peace I leave with you. I have spoken these things to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you're going to have trouble, but take courage. I have overcome the world. So no matter what happens, you know, and our, the people who are dying as martyrs today and, and even people in our own country who are going through incredibly difficult times, but this week I'm lifting up martyrs and I'm lifting up our Christian family who in many places and many nations are just being slaughtered because of their faith. I pray that God gives them peace. I pray that God gives them courage. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, God, we thank you. I lift up again. I pray that, God, I pray specifically that the United States of America is the great eagle spoken of in Revelation chapter 11. God, that the United States, again, at the very end, is a beacon of light and takes a last stand against the greatest evil empire ever to be on the earth. And God, also, we lift up Israel to you as, God, they live in constant danger, surrounded by enemies. And God, we pray that you continue to protect them as you have. God, we thank you for the restoration of Israel. That, that is a fulfillment of prophecy that we got to see and experience in the last generation. God, also, we lift up to you today our Christian family all over the world, many of whom, millions who are living in constant danger. God, we pray that you would give them peace in the middle of the storm. We pray that you would give them the martyr's courage. God, we pray that you would continue to bless them and use their lives. God, we pray you protect them and save them from that. But God, if it is your will, we pray that you would use their lives as an example and a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And God, thank you for the peace of God, which you give us no matter what's happening around us. In Jesus' name, amen.